Good evening, everybody, and welcome back, my friends. Tom Snyder with you here on the Wednesday Night Radio Show, October 9, 1991. Live and direct out of ABC Radio in Los Angeles, California. And tonight we welcome Molly Ivins to our program. Long considered one of the toughest, brassiest, and wittiest reporters in America today. To celebrate her caustic achievements, Random House has published a collection of her political essays called Molly Can't Say That, Can She? The subjects range from ethics Texas style to George Bush and the oil lobby. The book is a testament to the author's enduring faith in the flawed and absurd workings of the democratic process. Molly Ivins, as a matter of fact, has been ruffling people's feathers ever since she began writing her columns about Texas politics back in the 1960s. A former managing editor of the Texas Observer and a reporter for the New York Times, Molly Ivins currently contributes her columns and articles to the Dallas Times Herald, Mother Jones, The Progressive, and the McNeil Air News Hour on PBS. Molly Ivins of Austin, Texas on the radio show for Wednesday night. Tonight's program is brought to you in part by American Spectrum Encyclopedia, now available at your local bookstore. I'm Alex Trebek with another fun fact from the American Spectrum Encyclopedia. Today's answer is, this U.S. film actor played many cocky, aggressive, tough guy roles in classic gangster movies. I'll return with a question after this. Mommy, I need to do a book report on Alaska. Look in the American Spectrum Encyclopedia, dear. Mother, why was the Berlin Wall put up? It's in the American Spectrum Encyclopedia. Honey, let's start planning our cross-country vacation. Look in the American Spectrum Encyclopedia. The American Spectrum Encyclopedia. A colorful one-volume reference with over 17,000 entries and 3,800 illustrations. An encyclopedia for the entire family. And the only one endorsed by the American Booksellers Association. In bookstores everywhere. Although starring in such classic gangster movies as The Public Enemy and The Roaring Twenties, this actor won an Academy Award in 1942 for his portrayal of George M. Cohan in Yankee Doodle Dandy. Today's question is, who is James Cagney? That's today's fun fact. I'm Alex Trebek. Hi, Jack Frost here. You know, before I get too busy with a hard freeze, I wanted to make sure you get to Sears Brand Central. Because right now, the AT&T Answering System Telephone 1504 is on sale at Sears' lowest price ever. To $79.99, save $20 through October 12th. It's got a built-in phone, and you can get your messages from any touchtone phone. To $79.99 at Sears Brand Central, the brand you want at the store you trust. Boy, I'd love one, and I could just call you guys. I mean, once you get to know me, Jack Frost, I'm a pretty cool guy. <laughs> Hey, I'm a nice person. I deserve it. Sears semi-annual fine jewelry sale, here I come. Gold, gemstones, pearls, watches, even diamonds are on sale now. 25 to 65 percent below comparable values elsewhere. And if I spend at least $100 on my Sears charge, I get zero percent financing. I pay nothing till next year. Sears semi-annual fine jewelry sale is over on the 20th, so I better hurry. If you're a nice person and love a great sale, maybe you better hurry too. We are back with Molly Ivins, whose collection of essays is out now from Random House called Molly Can't Say That, Can She? Here from the Dallas Times Herald, Mother Jones, the Progressive, and the McNeil Lehrer News Hour is Molly Ivins of Austin, Texas. Welcome to these microphones. Well, thank you so kindly, and I am delighted to be here. Howdy, y'all. Uh, <laughs> if you were writing a column today about this incredible story taking place in Washington involving Professor Hill, uh, nominee Thomas and the issue of sexual harassment what would be your take on this one I mean is this one that you can you know start poking irreverent fun at or would you have to be a little bit serious about that oh yeah I'm, I'm my first instinct is to um, just be mad and fire about it um, I don't think any of us at this point know enough about and uh, about the allegations to know whether or not Professor Hill or Judge Thomas is is more in the right. On the other hand, whenever I hear one of these senators stand up and I ask, you know, why didn't this woman make this complaint ten years ago? I say the answer is in front of your nose, fool. Ever since this woman's complaint became public, her character, her motivation, her integrity, her veracity, and her common sense have been questioned in the most insulting language. That's why women don't file complaints about sexual mm -hmm, harassment. Mm -hmm. And of course, the question that the senators might well ask instead of that one would be, why was this information available to the committee uh, investigating the activities of Judge Thomas when he was before the committee? Why was this information 
withheld for a period of up to three weeks when it was available to the Judiciary Committee while the nominee was before them in, in questioning. I think there's so many questions to be raised about the conduct of members of that committee that it almost beggars the imagination. For example, Strom Thurmond. Uh, the day before <laughs> yesterday, bless his heart. Um, it's amazing, you know. And demanded indignantly why this woman had waited until two days before the confirmation vote before she made her charge. Well, it turns out that Senator Thurman himself knew about it at least two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And of course, this woman tried to make her allegations through the through all the proper procedures, through all the right channels, without drawing public attention to herself. I mean, she's not a publicity seeker. Um, it's, it's really, uh, at this point, an episode that reflects credit on nobody. Well, as somebody observed here last night, nobody is going to win in this situation. Certainly Judge Thomas is not going to win, and That's certainly correct. Professor Hill is going to come away from this damaged in some way, if she is not already damaged in some way. And, and, and the real losers here will be all the people involved. Nobody will come away a winner in this situation. I'm, I'm, I must say again, we none of us know enough to, to make any judgment on, on the allegation itself, but... Um, I have to admire the woman's courage. I see no way to read this as somehow uh, this woman <clears throat> doing this for her own advantage or to further herself. It seems to me that th I know the ordeal is painful and embarrassing for Judge Thomas. It is equally painful of course it for is. this woman. You know, somebody called in here last night. Uh, you know, talk radio produces a wide variety of opinions from people. And there is a certain amount of opinion in the country that maybe this is part of some liberal conspiracy to further discredit Judge Thomas. And as I said to the caller, I said, what amount of money do you suppose could be offered to a person such as Professor Hill to take this kind of a fall, to say, we will pay you a million dollars, but in the meantime, your reputation will be destroyed, uh, your credibility will be attacked, in many ways you'll be held up to public ridicule. I said, I don't think there's any amount of money available to any person, no matter how liberal, no matter how much he or she might dislike Judge Thomas as a Supreme Court nominee, to go through this kind of ordeal. It makes no sense whatsoever. No. And I must say in general that I, I tend to discount conspiracy theories of any kind. It's been my observation watching politics for the last 25 years that luck, chance, accident, and human stupidity account for far more in the direction of history than any conspiracy. <laughs> Speaking of all those attributes that you mentioned, how much of a part do they play in the politics that you cover on a regular basis, the, the politicians of Texas, from Governor Richards on down? Well, I must say, politics in the state of Texas, um, I, I try to explain to people, Texas really is just like everywhere else. It's just more so, Tom. <laughs> There is this sort of slightly lunatic quality of exaggeration of being larger than a life in a slightly pied way that afflicts that entire state. And, uh, of course, it makes it delightful to write about, uh, <laughs> even though the results are frequently awful. <laughs> Uh, we do have a good time. Uh, I cover the state legislature and politics generally, and of course um, we have contributed any number of politicians to the uh, national scene, and, uh, including uh, the only president we've got, George Bush. Well, there's some question as to whether you gave him to us or, or, or Connecticut and Maine gave him to well, us. I, 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 I know he yeah. keeps an apartment, I believe, in Houston, and he That's goes correct. down there to vote once every four years. That's correct. But I don't see him going there on vacation or holiday. It's usually up to Ken Kennebunkport. By the way, yeah. didn't you love when Nixon counseled uh, Bush and Quayle? to not spend so much time on the golf course or in power boats uh, or be, beca because, because most people, most don't, people have one. don't do that sort of thing all the time yeah <laughs> <laughs> there is a there's still a political shrewdness to Richard Nixon that that makes one stand back in awe from time to time well we think of George Bush as being uh, George Bush of Kenny Bunkport Maine and um, of course I can't speak for everybody in the great state but as you know we in Texas are very proud of our traditions of hospitality and friendliness and uh, by us a Texan by choice is just as good as a Texan by birth we don't discriminate mm -hmm. and besides practically everybody who died at the Alamo was from out of state originally <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so if you come to Texas and live there for a while you become a Texan and the, and the bad part is that it, you can't wash it off even if you move away again no, no. Um, <laughs> no you can't shampoo it out can you <laughs> so George Bush is, is uh, by all our standards of Texas we don't have citizenship requirements or exams or anything but I do want to point out Tom, just because there are certain cultural differences that really should be, remain clear in people's minds Real Texans do not use the word summer as a verb. 
<laughs> Real Texans do not wear those navy blue slacks with a little green whales all over them. And no real Texan has ever described trouble as deep doo-doo. <laughs> <laughs> Let me ask you about some of the people that the entire nation is familiar with uh, in, in political life that came from Texas. And, and I don't know if you knew these people, but I know you know of them, and I want to start with the speaker, Sam Rayburn. Um, one of my great heroes. and, and I'm uh, glad to hear that. I think one of, one of the best public service this, this public has ever seen. If you really want to know, of those of you who might not remember him, uh, the late speaker, Sam Rayburn, this was a man who spent 25 years in the third most powerful position in the United States government. When he died, he left a total estate of less than $8,000. That's the kind of man Sam mm -hmm. Rayburn was. Mm -hmm. He never made a nickel beyond what, his, what he was paid. What about his, his role in Texas politics? Was he not a mentor to Lyndon Johnson early on? Um, he was a mentor to Lyndon Johnson later on, later interestingly on, okay. enough. Uh, when when uh, Lyndon was already in the Senate, I think, was when he and Mr. Rayburn became close. And uh, Sam Rayburn was a man of extraordinary integrity, but he was no... Um, no sort of uh, soft fellow. Uh, he knew how to play hardball politics, mm -hmm. and he did. But he comes out of a wonderful old Texas political tradition. It's the populist tradition. Um, a movement going dating back to the 1880s and 1890s when uh, poor farmers in the, all over the South banded together with sharecroppers uh, and uh, small businessmen against the great economic royalists of the day. Those having been the, the evil eastern banks and the big railroads. Well, may, may I just interject yeah. here that not only did this take place in the south, but it also took place in the north and in my home state, which is Wisconsin, fighting Bob LaFollette. That's Follett, absolutely true. Uh, the right. Ripon Society, which was the liberal wing of the Republican Party. These were these were men and women and organizations in great populist tradition. Exactly. In, in the upper Midwest, populism was very strong. Minnesota, North Dakota. Mm -hmm. um, and it may have been, many historians think, the most democratic moment in American history. Um, among other things, the Populist Alliance fomented uh, small granges so that people got together in groups of about 100 and talked to one another about politics and public life in a way that we've never been able to replicate since. And uh, Rayburn was part of that great tradition and retained to the end of his life an intense dislike of concentrations of power and mm -hmm. wealth. There's another man uh, from your state for whom I have uh, great admiration. I've interviewed he and his wife Nellie, and you know who I'm talking about here, and that's the big guy, John Connolly. I I, uh, I get very emotional about him. I have great respect and affection for him. Yeah. Well, we're going to differ on this, Tom, okay. because uh, you're a fan and I'm not. Uh, John Connolly, to me, as a Texas political reporter, represented as governor and later in his career, a kind of what we have in Texas, really, and have had for a long time, and John Connolly, when he was governor, was a perfect exemplar of it, is a kind of state corporatism. It is the notion that government exists to, as we say in Texas, create a, a healthy business climate. That government exists to serve the interests of big business. And uh, I don't happen to agree with that. Mm -hmm. Well, my admiration, and I'm not backing off at all because mm -hmm. I still have it, is based on viewing him from afar. Mm -hmm. I, I, <laughs> there's something terribly charming about a man who said, <laughs> I spent uh, um, uh, 15 million dollars to get one vote at a Republican <laughs> convention. <laughs> he does, he does have a winning way uh, of uh, placing reality. On. And as a matter of fact, you know, the guy is talented. I'm the last person in the world to deny that. And people always think of John Connolly as, you know, smooth, suave, sort of the guy who looks like the perfect corporate executive. If you ever seen him on the back of a flatbed truck with his coat <laughs> off and his sleeves rolled up, you know that that's a man who can make a stump speech. Right, and also a man who's used to hard work somewhere along the way. I remember his uh, his line in one of the campaigns uh, that unless the trade arrangement with Japan doesn't change, if I'm president, they can sit in their Toyotas on the docks in Yokohama and watch their color television sets, but they're not coming in here. And there's something about me that responds to, I know that that's not possible, by the way. I know it's braggadocio, but I respond to it. To go back to, uh, to, uh... Nothing wrong with little Texas tough every now and then. Uh, yeah, to more tough talk from John Connolly. The fellow from South Carolina, Strom Thurmond, you know, this guy is getting so old, his hair is turning red. It's <laughs> unbelievable. <laughs> Jeez. I mean, I, I saw him up there. I said, Strom, go sorry. home for his sake. Jeez. <laughs> anyway, we're talking with Molly Ivins. Uh, her book is called Molly Can't Say That, Can She? And the answer is yes, she can. 
Uh, we'll be right back with all of you, and eventually some of you on the toll-free exchange after a station break. Marie Caruso of West Newton, Massachusetts, is telling us about her skin problems. I teach, and I teach at a community college. I just developed a jewelry allergy, because I was just breaking out exactly where a necklace would be, or a watch would be, or a bracelet, something that's on my skin. It was just a very annoying itch, and it would just itch like anything, and you would scratch till you scrape your skin off your arm. But Marie Caruso got relief using Triple Action Gold Bond Medicated Powder. Gold Bond has made itself part of my life. You don't expect a powder to do what Gold Bond can do. I mean, it's, it's, it's relief. It's great. Gold Bond's triple action is like three great powders in one. It has the absorbing action of powder, the medicating action of a proven itch fighter, and the drying action of zinc oxide. That's triple action Gold Bond. The itch! It's gone! Gold Bond is terrific. Try triple action Gold Bond medicated powder. Use only as directed. Available at drugstores and supermarkets everywhere. Okay, identify this. Yep, it's a dying refrigerator. Gave its life for cold cuts. Fortunately, if you weren't emotionally attached, Sears Brand Central can replace it. Until Saturday, there's a Kenmore 18 cubic foot top mount for $419 even. Save 30 bucks. All frostless, too. Believe me, that's a real good price for a Kenmore. But it's just till Saturday at Sears Brand Central. The brand you want at the store you trust. Prices may vary in Alaska, Hawaii, and Puerto Rico. I'm with the cereal counter for New Honey Almond Delight, the cereal that's deliciously different. One, two, three, yeah, what are you counting? Four, the sliced almonds. It sounds tasty. Crunchy nut clusters. Ooh, real tasty. And honey toasted flakes, the New Honey Almond Delight. So tasty, I'll love it. You've got to try some. Mmm. Mmm. Uh, could I have a few boxes? How's three? How's three thousand? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, twenty. New Honey Almond Delight cereal. It tastes deliciously different. Service 60 WICC is your hometown news and information leader. Count on WICC to bring you the news first as it happens. Will we win? Yes! Will Bridgeport have a future? Yes! Why, Connecticut? Well, every now and then you ought to do something just because it's right. The hell with the status quo. The status quo sucks out here in the state of Connecticut. People are out of work, and the state's deep in the red. Service 60 has Southern Connecticut's largest team of award-winning journalists. Have a good morning. This is Tim Quinn. In Monroe, John Silva, WICC News. At Captain's Cove, in one of our mobile units, Becky Sukup, WICC News. In Washington, Megan O'Connell, WICC News. In Bridgeport, Daria Allen, WICC News. Reporting from the Bridgeport Hilton, Sue Evans, WICC News. When news happens in your hometown, throughout Connecticut, across the country, or anywhere in the world, you can hear it first. Count on your hometown news and information leader. Service 60, WICC. We are back and we're talking with Molly Ivins, considered one of the toughest, brassiest, and wittiest reporters in America today. Are you still a reporter on the beat, or is the column now your sole means of communication with your audience? Um, I write a column three times a week, but I write it by covering the legislature the same way I did when I was a reporter. Uh, I'm there when uh, the gavel bangs, and uh, I'm there when they uh, declared it at an end for the day, and... Uh, I'm there for all the nonsense and the committee hearings and the subcommittee hearings and the second reading and the first reading and uh, all the other zoo things. That I've often on said there. here that, that you, you know, we really don't need a national comedy network. We have C-SPAN. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, oh, I love to watch them and the honorable gentleman from Missouri will now <laughs> yield to the right honorable gentleman. I mean, what are these people talking? <laughs> uh, uh. Well, you know, it is, it is been a lifelong crusade of mine. I understand why people get turned off on politics. I talk to people all the time and say, well, I'm just not interested in politics. And I'm, I have this terrible tendency to just want to grab them by the lapels and say, you have no idea what you're missing. Mm -hmm. It's so funny. It's better than the zoo. It's better than the circus. <laughs> Frankly, I think it's much more absorbing than following football or baseball, although I like both those games. I'm telling you, politics is the world's greatest game. It is better than three-dimensional chess, more complicated than high-stakes poker, and I love to watch it. The big danger, Tom, both for people who are in the game and those of us who watch it, is that we keep forgetting. We get so absorbed in who got dealt what cards and how they're holding and whether they're bluffing and who's going to fold that we forget that the chips on the table are people's lives in the years that you've covered the texas legislature and in the years that you've watched the national political scene can you give us the highlights in terms of humor 
the highlights, if there have been any, in terms of political courage that, 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 that you've witnessed, you know, things that have really uh, inspired you to write about them. Right. Um, I think both of those are really good questions, and uh, we were trying not long ago, a group of us, uh, to think of who was absolutely the sleaziest, sorriest guy we had ever seen <laughs> in uh, our political lives, and uh, there were so many nominations that for one beer we had to close the floor. <laughs> Uh, but for sheer entertainment value, I, I, it's a well, tough wait, 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 wait. Let, Let's go back to the sleaziest, though. Who are well, now, that's why I want to talk about a fellow named Mike Martin, a state representative from Longview, Texas. Elected in 1978, he was an early harbinger of the moral majority in the great state. He was elected on a platform of being pro-family and pro-American. Pretty controversial stuff. Well, the sad fact is that Mike Martin had barely a brain in his head, and he could not get a single bill passed. <laughs> Two years in the legislature, he couldn't even get a memorial resolution passed for citizens in his district who had died. It was pretty pathetic, and it is hard to get reelected if you have not passed a single bill. But, unexpectedly, for all of us who had written off Mike Martin as a hopeless piece of furniture, he came up with the most innovative, imaginative um, idea for getting himself reelected despite the fact that he had no record. He paid his cousin Charlie to shoot him in the arm with a <laughs> shotgun. He took one for the gipper. He did. <laughs> He's and he claimed that it had been done by a satanic and communistic cult on account of he was so pro-family and pro-American. <laughs> well, there was great confusion. All the law enforcement people in Central Texas went running around trying to find some satanic communistic cult, which is pretty hard to find <laughs> in Central Texas. <laughs> and um, the plot came unraveled, as plots often do, when Cousin Charlie uh, had too much to drink in a honky-tonk and spilled the beans. Now, this is where, and I point out to you, I know everybody thinks Texans brag, but where else would the state legislature have had to foresight to make it illegal to pay someone to shoot you. In Texas it is, so don't come down and try to have it done. I'm telling you right now. So uh, when all this came out, it turned out that uh, poor Representative Martin was wanted by the law. He was in deep trouble. And instead of facing the music, the guy took it on the lamb. He went underground, went on the run. We had to send the Texas Rangers after the man. And they hunted him high, hunted him low. At last, after two weeks, they tracked him to earth at his mama's house outside Longview, where they found him hiding in the stereo cabinet. Now, Tom, I'm here to tell you, many people have wondered what he was doing in the stereo cabinet. I know the man always did want to be speaker. <laughs> Bravo. That's in the category of reasons why I do not write fiction, because I can't make up stuff that good. And I don't see how anybody could even be close. Mike Martin, is that his name? That was his yeah, name. Sle <laughs> sleaze of the century, huh? <laughs> We've had some better than that. Well, I'll listen to more stories from Molly Ivins. Her book is called Molly Can't Say That can she? Uh, it's published in hardcover by Random House, and I'm going to open the toll-free exchange to all of you here. Uh, for the new listeners, the number is 800-248-0852. That's 800-248-0852. And after a brief but important station break, we're coming right back. Thanks for listening, everybody. You're on the radio show, and I'm Tom Snyder on Service 60 WICC. Friday and Saturday marks the 20th anniversary of the Dock Shopping Center in Stratford. Two big days of fun events and entertainment around fine stores like Stop and Shop, Toy Works, Staples, Walgreens, and Blockbuster Video. So come join the celebration at the Dock this Friday and Saturday. On Friday, say hello to me, WICC's John LaBarca, broadcasting live from 4 to 7 p.m. Bring the kids for storytelling by the fountain at 3 and 3.30 p.m. On Saturday, see the Antique Car Show, plus demonstrations by the Stratford Police and Fire Departments Red Cross EMS and Recycling Center. See the clowns take a horse and carriage ride. Hear music throughout the day starting at 10 a.m. with the Coastal Chordsman, followed by the Stratford High School Band. And at 1 p.m., the spectacular Connecticut Hurricanes Drum and Bugle Corps. Square dancing around the fountain, martial arts demonstrations, anniversary cake. It's fun for the family. Friday and Saturday, the Ducks, 20 years old and still growing. Take turnpike exit 33 North or 34 South. I went from house to house. You know, getting any food or clothes they'd give me. And then I handed it all out to any needy people in the neighborhood. That's it. Jack Powell is one of the little answers to the big problems facing every community in America. And because there are more people than problems, things will get done. All you have to do is something. Call the Points of Light Foundation at 1-800-677-7309. Do something good. Feel something real. A message from the Ad Council. Now that the state income tax is in place and that Hartford anti-income tax rally is behind us, it's time to talk to the governor about where we go from here. 
This is WICC News Director Tim Quinn, and you can get your chance to speak with Governor Lowell Weicker about taxes, crime, education, layoffs, the economy, anything else. WICC's Ask the Governor program returns this Thursday evening, October 10th, 7 p.m. Your chance to Ask the Governor, where? Right here on Service 60, WICC. And Service 60, your number one radio station, has a Hillbilly Country Breakfast. It's Saturday, October the 26th from 8 to noon at Unity Hill Church, United Church of Christ in Trumbull. Those winning numbers for this evening, the Daily 608-608, the Play 4 6029, the Play 4 6029, and the Service 60 forecast for tonight. Clear to partly cloudy skies, lows 50 to 55. Tomorrow, sunshine, that'll give way to some clouds later in the day. A mild day, highs about 74. Tomorrow night, some clouds, maybe a shower uh, during the overnight hour, lows down to 50. And the outlook for Friday, morning shower, otherwise becoming partly sunny and seasonable, highs around 65. We have the wind blowing out of the southwest at 14 miles per hour. The humidity, 73%. And the barometer reading 30.28 inches, and that's steady. Currently, it's 59 degrees at your weather station. Service 60 WICC. Once again, the daily 608, the play 4, 6029. And now more with TSN, the radio show. Uh, coming up later tonight on many of these same stations, we retrack and relive the great days of Amos and Andy on the radio and review the social implications and racial implications of that program among the most popular of all broadcasts of all time. That's coming up later on tonight on many of these same stations. I hope that your station is with us. If they're not, call up and demand why. We're talking tonight with Molly Ivins. Her book is called Molly Can't Say That, Can She? <sighs> The last one was so good, I have to ask you for one more. <laughs> well, you I got your great storyteller. I have an endless supply of them, I truly do. And uh, I just, uh, <laughs> the material is so good, it's hard to miss. Well, let's see, one of my other favorites. In fact, he's currently under indictment. It's the incumbent speaker of the Texas House of Representatives, a fellow named Gib Lewis. He is a rubber stamp magnate from Fort Worth, Texas. <laughs> Now, it is kind of redundant to say that the Texas Speaker is under indictment. It has been 25 years since we had a Speaker who wasn't indicted for something or other. <laughs> I take that back. We did have one. There was a guy who served from 73 to 75 who was never indicted. He was, however, shot to death by his wife. Who was in her turn not indicted? Anyway... Was there, well, was there a reason he was shot by his wife? Uh, well, well, the jury thought that it was justifiable. <laughs> Who did she catch him with? <laughs> <laughs> Just right along those lines. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, anyway, poor old Gib Lewis, our incumbent speaker, under indictment. And um, I try to explain to people, Gib, Gib struggles to express himself. He's, he's a gifted malapropist, the kind of guy who will thank the members at the end of the session by saying, I want to thank each and every one of y'all for having extinguished yourself. <laughs> <laughs> got re-elected uh, at the beginning of this session and uh, said, I can't tell you how grateful I am. I'm just filled with humidity. <laughs> uh, but I thought Giver's best performance every session down in Texas, we have what we call Disability Day. This is where we honor the handicapped citizens of Texas for trying to get the better access to the public buildings sure. for the handicapped people. Now, you understand we never give them a nickel for this purpose, but we always honor them for their efforts. So both houses had just resolutely up a storm, and the governor had issued a proclamation, and there we were in joint session. Now, your public access for the handicapped at the Capitol is not too good, but a bunch of them had managed to wedge their wheelchairs up in the back of the gallery there. And Speaker Lewis read both resolutions. He read the proclamation. Didn't make hardly any mistakes. We were all so proud. Then he looked up at the gallery and said, and now would y'all stand and be recognized? <laughs> I, I, I won't tell you my stories, but through the years in the Atlanta, or in the Georgia legislature in Atlanta, the city council in You know I'm not oh, exaggerating. Boy, oh boy, you oh know boy. I'm not yeah, making there, it up. There, there, there's one I... I I can allude to it. There was a fellow who was the city council president in uh, in uh, Philadelphia. Paul Dortona was his name, mm -hmm. an old line Democratic politician of Italian extraction, whose family had been in the in the pews for centuries. Mm -hmm. And one day, the mayor of Lagos, Nigeria, was in town. And I don't have to tell you how he pronounced Nigeria, but it wasn't a pretty sight. Okay? <laughs> it was just awful. It was truly awful. <laughs> here is here is Harry joining us now from Baltimore, Maryland. Hi, Harry. You're on. Hey, you're the first caller tonight. Good evening. How are you? I'm well, thanks. Molly, you're marvelous. Oh, thank you. You're as great over the air as you are on the printed page. <laughs> I have two questions. 
When, is there any uh, publication uh, in which you're regularly appearing now, uh, uh, national publication, magazine, or anything? Um, yeah, I have a regular monthly column in the Progressive magazine by George. There's one with a mighty circulation. Progressive. I pick all the high payers. Oh, um, okay. I'm regularly in Mother Jones and... Uh, the Nation. Yes, I've read yeah, in Mother Jones. Fairly, fairly frequently on NPR and McNeil Lair. Yeah, so great. stay tuned. The other question is... And buy the book. If I may, it's slightly off the subject, but this man, another Westerner, but north of you from Wyoming, this man Simpson absolutely perplexes me. I don't know if you have any thoughts on Senator Simpson. I well, Alan Simpson, I, yes. yeah, I saw him today going on and on about something, and I forget what it was. Well, he was very threatening, uh, intimidating toward Anita Hill, and he was on with he, Nina Totten. Yeah, exactly right, exactly right. And, and, and let me by, say, by, that, by, is by, not, that is not me, the first excuse, time. Excuse me, yeah. isn't this the guy that said that, uh, that Peter Arnett was a traitor? Yes, exactly. Yeah, well, the then we don't have to consider much. I thought you could make Maybe explain him from a Western standpoint, what, how he well, makes him... Well, I've, I've watched this before with Simpson. One tends to like Alan Simpson to begin with because he's an extremely bright guy and... Um in my opinion, fairly rarely for someone that conservative, he really has a delightful sense of humor. Yep. Uh, but I have watched him tangle before. He has a particular tendency to be arrogant and condescending toward women. Uh, his performance uh, with the women who test tried to testify against Judge Souter during that Senate confirmation process, I still remember just almost wincing with pain. It was he's so nasty. bad. He, he's nasty. Yes, he's, he's a just, mean man. He's nasty. And you don't notice it at first because he can be delightful and charming. Is it because he's Western? Does it have anything? I wonder about that. There is... Uh, I don't think so. I mean, I know that there is a kind of Western conservatism that distrusts Washington, and there, there are certain characteristics that, that we do have in common out here. But Simpson does not seem to me to be out of that tradition. No, I don't know what it is. I don't know enough about him. Yeah, well, thank you, Miss Ivins. It's an honor to talk with you. Well, bless your heart. Thank Harry, you thanks for, for joining us tonight, my friend. Bye-bye now. Bye. Here is uh, Robbie in Fort Worth, Texas. Hello. Fort Worth, Cowtown. Hello, Tom. Hi, how are you, Rob? I'm doing very well. Good. Um, I was listening about, I was going to talk about John Connolly, and then I wanted to talk about Alan Simpson since that was raised, if that's okay. Go ahead. Okay. Um, you had a, someone had talked about uh, the uh, Simpson uh, hear, uh, hearing about Souter hearings, about mm -hmm. his actions, mm -hmm. and he said something about the girls, that Strom Thurmond said that, but it wasn't the girls, he said ladies. Uh, you look very nice today, and that's not a condescending thing to ladies, I wouldn't think. Miss Ivins, what do you think about that? Oh, you know, that's one of those things that's sort of borderline. It depends on the time and the place. Well, I was going to say, if you're... If, and the people. You know. I know, and I know that many times, uh, particularly um, men who are older, believe that they are simply being courteous and formal when they compliment ladies in a very gushing way. And sometimes, yeah, you know, when, when there are issues of enormous importance to women on the line, and instead of listening to a lot of sort of sweet southern courtesy, we just want to say, damn it, you know, we're women and we want our rights and, and we're here to, to speak and seriously let's, let's get down and, to and business. Cut, yeah. the, cut the old courtesies. And yet I understand it is not intended to be offensive. Well, one, Tom Fort Worth had the distinction of having uh, Gib Lewis and Jim Wright, both from Fort Worth, being the pr respective uh, speakers of the House at one time. That's right. But Cradle unfortunately, of <clears throat> one of two bowed out. Well, the other thing I wanted to say about John Connolly, I researched the Kennedy assassination quite a bit. I'm 33 and not that old, but uh, have you, Miss Ivins, have you heard anything that uh, has changed in the past 28 years uh, about his recollections of uh, uh, Johnson's? The last time I saw Connolly interviewed about the assassination was just about two months ago on C-SPAN, and no, there did not seem to be anything new. Um, I will tell you, and I know that many of us in Texas are obsessed with, with that assassination. I go back to something I said to Tom earlier. Um, I tend to disbelieve conspiracy theories simply because I find that accident and stupidity, stupidity count so much. And I don't know any more than you do what, what really happened that day in Dallas, but I will tell you, and so will everybody else who has ever tried to guard a president, one lone nut with a gun can get anyone. It doesn't take a conspiracy. Well, it doesn't take a mastermind. You know, I I am not a conspiratorial person, and I don't believe in conspiracy theories. I know that the Warren Commission report is flawed. Oh, absolutely. I, I think that its, that its major flaw was that it, it, it did not set out to determine who killed President Kennedy. It set out to determine that Lee Harvey Oswald killed President Kennedy. So they, they set out with the wrong premise. However, I truly believe that there are moments in human history 
when seemingly inexplicable things happen in the twinkling of an eye that explains how the rifle was fired that many times in that short a period of time, even though the ballistic experts say it couldn't be done. Uh, it, you know, to go back to the old bromide, there's no reason for a hummingbird or a, a bumblebee to fly because its its wings can't support its body, yet somehow... Aerodynamic it, it, by impossible. Yeah, but right. somehow the darn thing flies. Going back to this thing about, about harassment, I, I appreciate what Robbie says here, and I appreciate what you say. If If... If men and women are gathered at a social occasion and a man says to a woman, you know, you really look terrific today, that's one thing. But if a woman is appearing before a committee of Congress to testify on a matter of great or trivial national importance, that is not the place to pass out the girly girly compliments. You know, I think I, you I say time, and, time and place are, are also a determining factor. There's, there's, there's something else, too, that I want to point out about the Clarence Thomas Professor Hill said to... Could you do it in, in just a minute? I have to right. get... The, I don't have to get this break in, but it'd be helpful if I did, you know. We will continue with Molly Ivins and continue with more of you on the toll-free exchange right after a station break. It's the Sears Home Sale, when you can get beautiful home furnishings at some of the lowest prices of the year. Like big, thirsty, 100% cotton bath towels for an unbelievably low $2.99 while quantities last. The lowest price around for a towel of this size and weight. And Sears has mattresses starting as low as $69.88 for the twin size, plus all the best names like Sealy and Spring Air. Get to Sears Home Sale while the selection is up and the prices are down. But hurry, the sale ends October 26th. Now, there's a math course on cassettes called Hooked on Math, which makes learning math simple. Simple because Hooked on Math is set to music. This way, kids learn quickly, like words to a song. And when they master addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division, they'll go right to the head of the class. If you want your preschooler to excel, or if there's an older student who needs help with math, call 1-800-ABCDEFG. 1-800-ABCDEFG. Hi, this is WICC 60's John LaBarca inviting you to meet me at the Dock in Stratford this Friday. That's the Dock Shopping Center for the 20th anniversary celebration. I'll be at the Dock broadcasting live on WICC 60 from 4 to 7 p.m. I'll be right in front of Stop and Shop with lots of prizes for you to win in front events and entertainment around the Dock's fine stores like Bradley's, Toy Works, Staples, Walgreens, and Blockbuster Video. Come join the celebration at the Dock this Friday. Toast the Dock with wine and champagne tasting at the Captain's Cake and visit the Bank Mart's real estate booth and learn about purchasing bank-owned real estate and low mortgage rates. We'll kick things off on Friday, but the anniversary celebration continues on Saturday with lots more fun and entertainment for the whole family. Take Turnpike Exit 33. The dock's 20 years old and still growing. And don't forget, I'll be there Friday from 4 to 7. Stop by and say hello and have a piece of anniversary cake with your friends from the dock in Service 60 WICC. Hi, this is WICC 60's JLB, John LaBarca, and I'm inviting you to join me for the WICC 60 Morning Show. Every weekday morning, Monday through Friday, 5 a.m. to 10 a.m. I'll be here to get you started on the right foot. Join me and my breakfast buddy, award-winning veteran newsman Tim Quinn. What is this breakfast buddy? I mean, you know, we're just talking and you got food. Always with the food. What's with the food? Well, you eat food for breakfast. I figured, you know, it's a mm, nice companion. Uh, along with constantly up updated traffic reports from Flight 60 and the one and only Morgan Kaolian, accurate weather forecast from the WICC Weather Center and Chief Meteorologist Joe Fury. We've got great music. Our quick question lets you win great prizes every day. And Susan Granger has the entertainment beat covered. And gee, we've got so much. I, I don't know what else to say, Tim. I don't know, but I'm sure it'll have something to do with food knowing you. That's right. So have breakfast with me and my buddy Tim Quinn and all the other characters right here on Service 60 WICC. You're listening to Service 60 WICC. We're back with Molly Ivins of Austin, Texas. Her book is titled, Molly Can't Say That, Can She? The subject's ranging from ethics, Texas style, to George Bush and the White House. It's out now in hardcover. You were going to say something about sexual... Is, is it harassment or harassment or both? I think it's harassment, but what do I, I, I know? Like that. I like it. I'm better. from East Texas. Um, <laughs> You're bothering, right? right. Sex, sexual bothering. You know, we went through this whole thing about sexual harassment and uh, so-called womanizing during the Senate confirmation hearings over our late Senator John Tower. Um, and I wrote at the time, and I still believe, that I've got nothing against men who like whiskey and women. I tend to like them. Uh, but there is a problem 
with men who come on to women in inappropriate circumstances. And it's not just depending on the social circumstances. It's not even dependent on whether or not the woman is sophisticated enough to take a flirtatious remark in, in a light way or the way it's intended. The difference is this, Tom. If a man comes on to a woman in a, in a flirtatious way in a situation when they're on an even footing, and when she, if she's not interested, is in a position to say, back off, Jack, I'm not interested, that's fine. And there is no consequence for Exactly. It. But when a man comes on to a woman who is psychologically or economically vulnerable to him, when a boss hits on a secretary, when a psychiatrist hits on a patient, when a professor hits on a student, that has nothing to do with, you know, fine, lusty pursuit of a good time that might be enjoyed by both parties. That is abuse of power, and it's very ugly. I wanted to ask you one other question here when this man called in about the assassination. After the Jim Reda uh, Jeffrey Dahmer incident in Milwaukee, there were reams of articles written on what this had done to the psyche of a city and the people who lived there. What about Dallas and the assassination? Does that linger there? Well, what Dallas has never gotten over it. Let me tell you how pathetic it is. Uh, about two years ago, uh, South Fork, the mythical home of J.R. Ewing surely, of Dallas surely. television fame, finally surpassed the Kennedy assassination site as the number one tourist attraction in Dallas, Texas, and that everybody in Dallas was delighted. I mean, imagine being known for J.R. Ewing mm -hmm. and being happy about it. Rather than Lee Harvey Oswald and the death of JFK. Okay. We're with Molly Ivins of Texas. Here is Lawrence now in Huntington, New York. Hello. Yes, good evening. Good evening, sir. Hi there. Uh, I just want, well, we want to tell you, first of all, that we like your show very much. Thank you. And uh, I have a question for Molly. Now, Molly, uh, throughout uh, modern Texan history, uh, women have played prominent roles in, in uh, state government. You had the first uh, elected state governor, you know, for, for any state in the Union, Miriam Ferguson, back in 1924, and, and now a lot of your big cities have... Uh, mayors who are women and uh, you know governor is also a woman. I'm just curious is there a tradition in Texas where uh, w women uh, have always held a you know key positions in government? Well, um, no. In fact, I, much as I would love to brag on my home state, um, I think we have to point out, first of all, that Ma Ferguson uh, was an accidental governor. The way she became governor was we impeached her husband, Pa, for good cause. <laughs> now, in fact, Ma later did get elected to a term in her own right. Uh, let me tell you about the platform she ran on. She ran on a platform of outlawing the teaching of Latin in the public schools of Texas on the grounds that the Bible is written in English, and if English was good enough for Jesus, it is good, good enough, enough for, for the you. school children of Texas. <laughs> Uh, I have to say that Ma Ferguson was sort of an embarrassment to our gender, in all honesty. Um, now, more recent developments, and I, and I think that is interesting. As the man points out, um, eight of our ten largest cities have had women mayors, either currently or within the past few years, um, which is a remarkable development. Now, I could point out, cynically, uh, that in the Southwest, our tradition is that we don't pay our mayors. Uh, a really tough job with no or low pay sounds like a woman's job to me. Um, actually, I'm just being a little, a little facetious there. Um, I think that women in politics in Texas, uh, like everywhere else, have really worked their way up from traditional sort of women's roles like the school board, the PTA, the art board, the museums, parks and recreation, to, of course, the city council, and then inevitably they have become mayors. mayors right. um, but there is a glass ceiling in politics for women as there is in every other field. And the one person who has broken through the glass ceiling is our governor, Ann Richards, and that is an election that I do consider genuinely significant for women. Lawrence, thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you very much. All right. Okay, bye-bye. Goodbye. Where's the glass ceiling in, in the life of Molly Ivins? Well, I was talking earlier uh, today uh, about the newspaper business where I spent my life. Uh, when I first started in the newspaper business, um, I felt I had to go back and get an extra credential. I went back and got a master's degree uh, after I'd already worked in a newspaper simply because in those days, uh, a woman starting the newspaper business without an extra credential was not going to have anything like an even break. You automatically got shipped off to cover food, fluff, and fashion. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that has changed. I think young women going to the newspaper business today have an equal chance to get hired out of school. I think they have an equal chance to get good assignments, which they didn't used to do. Uh, in fact, I'm convinced the only reason that... Um, 
I ever made it as a reporter is because I'm so big. I'm six feet tall. I towered over every editor I ever worked for. Nobody could ever look at me and say, oh, that poor, sweet, dainty little thing. We couldn't possibly send her out to cover a ride. It was always, Ivan, get your butt out there. Um, I do think that that women now in, in, my, in our business have a better shot at good assignments. I still think there's a glass ceiling in journalism for women, and it comes when we talk about promotion to management. Well, I think that there is a... I work in broadcasting. There is certainly a glass ceiling in broadcasting for talent, both men and women, when it comes to management. Uh, Walter Cronkite, for all he did, never assumed the presidency of NBC, nor did Edward R. Murrow, etc., etc., etc. So sometimes the glass ceiling covers all of us. Uh, Alex in Dallas, Texas. Hello. Good evening, Tom Good evening, sir. and Molly. I've, I've enjoyed your column for years in the Dallas Times Herald, and I wanted to comment on a very compassionate piece you wrote once on Vietnam two or three years ago. While you've been on leave writing your book, the newspapers have been running some of your old columns, and uh, if, if you're still going to run those old columns, could you maybe ask them to run that column on Vietnam? Uh, that was where you addressed those of us who went, those of us who, those other ones who decided not to go, and I wonder if you would comment on the Vietnam War and its effect uh, 20 years later of American society. Bless your heart. I remember that column really well, and uh, you may be interested to know that it is um, the only column, newspaper column, uh, for the Dallas Times Herald I wrote that is included in the collection of my work, uh, now published by Random House. The column got an extraordinary reaction. I wrote it as a short story, um, and I, I think anyone who reads it knows where it came from. Um, it's just about a visit to the Vietnam War. Uh, in, in fact, in glancing through your book today, I, I did not read the column, but it starts off, he had always known that he would go to visit the wall, etc., etc., etc. The book, Alex, if you want to take another look, and, uh, and uh, possibly uh, Molly will speak with her newspaper and they'll run the column again. Thanks for calling him. I'd be glad to ask one other thing. Please. I'll tell you, you can, but let me get rid of the commercial business here. I'll be right back to you, my friend. We'll continue with Molly Ivins for a few more seconds. And then later on most of these same stations, we go back to the days of Amos and Andy on Big Time Network Radio. As I say, on most of these same stations, if your station's not one of them, call up and demand to know why. We'll be right back after these messages. Are you an inventor? Or do you know an inventor who would like to have an invention or idea submitted to industry? For free information on how to proceed, phone 1-800-727-IDEA. Invention Submission Corporation, one of America's largest invention service organizations, has an inventor's kit you can have free. It contains a form for recording your invention's date of origination, plus an informative brochure and other material of interest to new inventors. Get your free kit by dialing 1-800-727-IDEA. IDEA. That's 727-IDEA. Even if you only have an idea for improving an existing product and don't know where to go with it, you will want this free inventor's kit. It shows you how your invention may be packaged and submitted to industry through a data bank and by various other means. It's a free call, so dial 1-800-727-IDEA. That's 727-IDEA. Okay, identify this. Yep, it's a dying refrigerator. Gave its life for cold cuts. Fortunately, if you weren't emotionally attached, Sears Brand Central can replace it. Until Saturday, there's a Kenmore 18 cubic foot top mount for $419 even. Save 30 bucks. All frostless, too. Believe me, that's a real good price for a Kenmore. But it's just till Saturday at Sears Brand Central. The brand you want at the store you trust. Prices may vary in Alaska, Hawaii, and Puerto Rico. Now, there's a math course on cassettes called Hooked on Math, which makes learning math simple. Simple because Hooked on Math is set to music. This way kids learn quickly, like words to a song. And when they master addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division, they'll go right to the head of the class. If you want your preschooler to excel, or if there's an older student who needs help with math, call 1-800-ABCDEFG. 1-800-ABCDEFG. 
Hi, Jack Frost here. You know, before I get too busy with a hard freeze, I wanted to make sure you get to Sears Brand Central. Because right now, the AT&T Cordless Telephone 4300 is on sale at Sears, lowest price ever. To $69.99, save $10 through October 12th. It's got two-channel selection from the handset, and you can page the handset from the base. Now just $69.99 at Sears Brand Central, the brand you want at the store you trust. Boy, I'd love one, and I could just call you guys. I mean, once you get to know me, Jack Frost, I'm a pretty cool guy. <laughs> If you've always wanted a powerful vocabulary, but found most programs boring, try We the People, the cassette program that combines college-level vocabulary with American history. So now, while developing a dynamite vocabulary, you'll become an expert on American history. Get We the People, the vocabulary program that teaches more than just vocabulary. Call 1-800-ABCDEFG. We're with Molly Ivins tonight, tomorrow night here, a terrific writer of nonfiction, a man who's covered some of the great criminal trials and events in our history, writer Joe McGinnis of the Philadelphia Inquirer in days gone by on all of these same stations tomorrow night. All right, Alex, wrap it quickly, please. Hello. Yes, Molly, quite, many of your columns you talked about Odessa, Texas, and I wondered, is Odessa your home, and do you have any good humorous stories to tell about it? Um, I have some great stories to tell about Odessa. Let me see if I can do one real quickly. You know Warren Burnett's the great trial lawyer lives out there, and uh, about ten years ago, state college court named Boyd fixed to put a new four-year school somewhere out in West Texas. Question rose whether middle of Odessa would get this plum. City fathers of Odessa long considered Burnett to be a card can communist. He does occasionally defend blacks and browns for free. But they knew he was the best lawyer around, so they grabbed their teeth and hired him to represent the case, which he did magniloquently, grandiloquently, for all the state college coordinating board. He got all through. Chairman looked at him and said, Mr. Burnett, this has indeed been a most impressive presentation. I really am just left with one question to ask you. Do you honestly believe there is justification for a four-year college in Odessa? One beamed and said, Mr. Chairman, there is enough ignorance in Odessa to justify I need your school. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, your sense of timing is impeccable. I cannot tell you how much I've enjoyed this hour. I'm an enormous fan of your work. And sometime, if you are a drinking woman, I'd let, like to have one of those with you and just listen to some stories. Terrific. Molly, thank you for joining us tonight. I loved it. Okay, thank you. me too. Molly Ivins. The book is called Molly Can't Say That, Can She? It's out now in hardcover from Random House. Tonight's program brought to you in part by American Spectrum Encyclopedia, now available at your local bookstore. I'm T.S. in Southern California. Thanks for listening, everybody.